Thank you. Is that best? Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Haley Sohn, and I am here from Yvonne Smalley's group at University of Colorado at Boulder. And today, the work I'll be presenting to you on topological solitons is a culmination of work done by various PhD students and postdocs in our lab, and even an undergraduate student that I've been advising for the last few years. Now, topological solitons have been of particular interest to theorists in high energy physics and cosmology for many years. And recently, uh, experimental condensed matter physicists have also taken an interest. So let's first look at the two-dimensional analog of the skirm solitons that are of interest in high energy physics. And we call those baby skirmions. And these configurations, as you can see here, are continuous and non-singular non and topologically protected because you cannot eliminate this type of configuration by any smooth deformations of the field or just wiggling the vectors to get it to unwind. And we can map this configuration to the S2 order parameter space and see that we cover the S2 sphere precisely once. And so we give this baby skirmion, in particular, a skirmion number of one. So like I mentioned, these skirmions are part of the second homotopy group. So they are classified by integer numbers. Now recently, in our liquid crystal group, we have also stabilized three-dimensional solitons, or hopfions, in ferromagnetic liquid crystals. And in these cases, each point on the S2 sphere corresponds to a pair of linked loops in three-dimensional space. And we can analyze these loops and analyze their linking number, which tells us some information about the hop invariant of these topological solitons that belong to the third homotopy group, pi 3 S2. Now, for this presentation in particular, I'll be focusing on our baby skirmions. So this is all we need to worry about right now is this type of configuration. And we can stabilize these baby skirmions in chiral pneumatic liquid crystals by utilizing the chiral tendency of these liquid crystals to twist. So here we can visualize the type of twist in our liquid crystals as it twists by 2 pi over a distance that we classify as the pitch. And we confine this twist between substrates with vertical surface boundary conditions. And you'll see that that means our boundary conditions are incompatible with the twist. So we create some kind of energetic frustration that then results in these spontaneously appearing topological solitons. And we get various types of topological solitons, as you can see in this image, which is between cross polarizers, it's a polarizing optical microscopy image. So we can view these solitons in this way, but to get more information, we can also use a 3D imaging technique to probe through our sample to understand the three-dimensional director structure based on uh, the self-fluorescence of these rod-like liquid crystal molecules. So I'll show some images that we get from this 3D imaging technique a little bit later in the presentation. But for now, let's return to this view of our baby skirmion. So far, we've been looking at our baby skirmion in the xy plane. And that means that we're looking down onto this structure. So you might start to wonder if this is the same in 3D space or if there's some kind of variation as we look three-dimensionally at our structure. And the answer to that lies in the boundary conditions, like I was mentioning before. So here you can see, as we look from the side, here and here in our numerical simulation, that we have a localized structure in three dimensions that is stabilized near the substrates by hyperbolic point defects. But as we change the boundary conditions from strong to weak and finite, you can see that these, this structure changes and the point defects are no longer required by the boundary conditions, so they escape through the substrates, if you will. 
And therefore, now we have this relatively translationally invariant structure. And so from the side, our soliton looks more like that. So we can have both cases in our experiment. Now to generate these nice uh, numerical images, we utilize a, an energy minimization technique based on the frank ozine free energy, which we have already seen this morning. So to a quick review, we have terms here that account for the splay, twist, and bend deformations as far and as well as the cost from the electric coupling term. Yes. Yes, we also account for the boundary conditions here. I don't go into it very much, but I could show you after the talk. <laughs> So we start with a random initial conditions of our three-dimensional grid, and we minimize it using a finite difference relaxation method. And that gives us these three-dimensional solitons that we can visualize by means of these free energy density isosurfaces, which I'm showing here. We have another technique. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right, so here we refer to them as solitons because whenever we notice that these solitons translate throughout our material, it's via rotational dynamics and moving as a packet of that orientation. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. So we also, in our numerical simulations, we've started employing a brand new technique uh, based on radial basis function finite difference method. And in this technique, we are not confined to our evenly spaced three-dimensional grid. Instead, we can generate a random grid and use this technique to do computations on larger and larger volumes. And so here you can see that we have nice agreement between this random grid and our three-dimensional grid. And so we are excited to start employing this technique even more to uh, have higher computational capabilities. So here, looking at different cross sections through our soliton, we can zoom in on the point defects and start to understand how those look. But as I'm showing you these images, they might not be very informative to you. It's hard to visualize the entire structure when you're just looking at different planes at once. So we also utilize these streamlines to visualize our topological solitons. So for instance, if we have our director twisting out through the middle of a double twist cylinder, we can trace the streamlines that are parallel to the local director orientation, and we can get this nice double twist cylinder that we then can wrap on itself, and those streamlines start to form torus knots. So here we have something that's reflective of a typical Hopf link where you go through, through the torus once and around once. And then in this case, if our P and Q indices are three and two, you go th through the torus three times and around twice. And so we see in our topological solitons, depending on the distance out from our center, we get various torus knots of these streamlines that have to do with the director field orientation. So here you can see the various torus knots that we get, and these surfaces are normalized to be the same size, but in reality, you can see that they are embedded in each other. Then as we apply some electric field, we see that the streamlines morph and deform drastically, even at low applied electric field. So this is from zero to four volts here. So next, let's take a look at what happens to these solitons as we apply electric field. And in this particular case, we're starting with our soliton, which is axially symmetric. 
and here viewed between cross polarizers, and here numerically. And as we start to apply electric fields in this direction, perpendicular to the plane of the screen, in this material, uh, which it has negative dielectric anisotropy, the far field director starts to turn to be perpendicular. And with more and more applied fields, you can see here that the far field director is now perpendicular to what we started with. So you might also notice that it looks very different now, both in experiment and our numerical simulations. This director structure is completely different from when we started. Yes. Yes, so we have vectorized the field for our simulations to make it um, more useful to visualize it in this context and compare it to other topological research. So that leads me to the fact that topologically, we can see that in all three cases, we can still map our configuration to S2 once and show that we have conserved our topological skirmion number of one. And so now, with the field applied, we have a new way of visualizing these topological solitons in that we have our south pole pre-image, which corresponds to the orientation pointing down of this S2 sphere, and likewise the north pole pre-image. And every other orientation on the S2 sphere would also have a related pre-image. Yes. Yes, so this is still the, the XY cross-section, so looking down on the south. Yes, yes, exactly. And so we can look at our 3D imaging method in order to test whether we understand this structure computationally and, numeric or computationally and experimentally. And so using our uh, numerical minimized data, we can generate what we expect the 3D imaging to look like. And then we see that lines up very well with the experimental fluorescence images. And I hope this convinces you that we have a well-rounded understanding and can generate these solitons both in numerics and experiment at no applied field and applied field. So when we do apply field, and these solitons become asymmetric in nature, they also start to act and interact like electrostatic dipoles. So for instance, if we bring them close together at various initial conditions here and release them, they will either attract or repel. And we can utilize this at different voltages to form various self-assembled structures of multiple solitons at once. And we, an yes, an anti-soliton. Not in our experiment so far. I think there might be an analog for that, but not in our work. And so here with varying the applied voltage, we can control the strength of these interactions and therefore control the self-assembly of numerous solitons together into arrays, or hexagonal close patch clusters or chains, like I mentioned before. And this self-assembly is highly tunable because of the fact that our solitons are rather squish squishy and reconfigurable in nature. And so far, we've been looking at constant applied voltage at high, high carrier frequency in the kilohertz range. So what happens if we turn that high frequency on and off at a certain modulation frequency? We see that when we turn the frequency or we turn the voltage on, we have translation of the soliton in one direction, but when we turn it off, we have a larger magnitude translation in the other direction. And this results in some net translational motion of our soliton that we call squirming. And we can control the direction of this motion 
by varying the modulation frequency, as you can see here. So we want to start understanding how this happens. And let's go back first to our axially symmetric topological solitons in no applied field. And let's turn the field on and watch what happens. So here you can see that as we turn the field on, the far field tilt is random throughout our sample. So the various areas of light and dark regions are areas with different tilt directions. And as the north and south pole parts of the soliton come together, they are pointing in all different directions in this field. But as time goes by, and the, fields, the far field starts to align, you can see that the angle that these uh, solitons are facing, if we draw a vector from the south to the north pole pre-images, lines up. And eventually, we have our solitons all pointing in the same direction. So where is all of this motion coming from? If we look at POM images, experimental images, of a single soliton, as we're turning this field on and off, we can see that we have this morphing that we've observed before, but it's asymmetric. When the field is turned off, it looks different from when the field is turned on. And we can reproduce these kinds of textures by taking our uh, numerically, Im uh, numerically simulated images and running them through a Jones matrix method where we can simulate the POM images that we would get with those results. And we see that we have the same interesting non-reciprocal morphing. Additionally, with our streamlined visualization, we can watch as it morphs in the same asymmetric way. And this asymmetric morphing and rotational dynamics leads to some net translation of our soliton in the plane of the solitonic configuration. And this is very similar to how magnetic skirmions move in magnetic field or in magnetic films. And we can understand that similar to in those films, we are operating in the absence of backflow in these systems, which we can confirm by dispersing tracer nanoparticles in the bulk of our liquid crystal and watching as we pass a soliton through this dispersion of nanoparticles and see if they react to any flows that might be present. And so here, with the help of this time-coded plot, you can see that the tracer nanoparticles actually just wiggle around in a way that we would expect from Brownian particles. And the skirmion is able to move through these, uh, this nanoparticle dispersion without us seeing any sign of flow. And so since our solitons are topologically protected, we can change and morph them to get different interesting configurations. And one of those that I'll show here is when we take the point defects of our topological soliton and pull them apart with laser tweezers, we can get this interesting stretched structure. And we can slice it in all different ways and understand the various uh, director configurations numerically. But what I want to point out here is that in this cross section, cutting down through our soliton, we have a skirmion that we're familiar with. And so, we can modulate field even in a material with positive dielectric anisotropy and induce this asymmetric morphing of the structure it, that results in some displacement of the structure over time. We can also use these uh, solitons to carry cargo. And so going back to the soliton that we looked at uh, previously, we can see bright field images of the soliton and the soliton with cargo and induce some motion of both of those cases and see that the skirmion and the skirmion with cargo move at the same velocity and we can control the direction with the modulation frequency as well. Additionally, we can control the separation distance 
of these solitons as they move in some interesting paths. We can control the directionality and the speed of that motion. And with modulating the voltage and changing the frequency, we can control the self-assembly of these solitons into various chains and clusters. Oh. And as we have more and more solitons in our field of view, yes? Yes. We have not done that experiment, but that would be very interesting to see. I expect that they wouldn't because the cargo is completely embedded in the between the point defects, but that would be interesting to see. So, okay. <laughs> so as we scale this up and have more and more solitons, we see some interesting emergent behavior happening as they self-symbol into chains and start to swirl. And as we step through time, we can see those trajectories. And we can also observe various types of motion of these solitons. So looking at an array of solitons, we can analyze and visualize the defect structures and grain boundaries within our array in this way. And as we induce motion, even at a very low voltage, here only two volts, we see the defects start to move around and propagate. And this, for us, is reminiscent of how defects move along the grain boundaries in metals to mediate plasticity. And if we zoom in, we can see that these defects do step along the grain boundaries. And finally, we can induce even more emergent behavior and interesting dynamics of these solitons as they move and interact with each other. And so as we track track the trajectories of these solitons with time, again, using the scale, we are reminded of various active systems in nature that we're all familiar with. So for instance, schools of fish, herds of animals, and even crowds of people trying to get into a store at Black Friday. And so in order to understand how these systems work, we notice that they're the all of these systems are connected by their statistics. So these, as you count the animals or particles in a given area for these systems, you'll start to notice these giant number fluctuations, which would not be the case for passive or Brownian particles. So the way we analyze this is that we take various areas and analyze the root mean square and the mean number of particles in those areas. And based on some theoretical work that's been done for self-propelled particles, we can make a log-log plot of those uh, statistics and get a slope for particles without cohesion that is very different from particles with cohesion or clustering. And so in our systems, we have these various states that we can induce individual chains and clusters of particles. Yes, I'm running low on time, so I might. <laughs> Thanks, I'll get to your question in just a minute. And so as we analyze our individual skirmions, we see that they do act like active individual particles. And likewise, for our clusters of skirmions, they also act like self-propelled particles in active systems. And we have this third case, which is different from any of the theory that has been done so far, and that is of these chains. And we see that they, too, act like individual active particles. And so quickly, I also want to touch on another means of out-of-equilibrium behavior that we are able to induce in our systems, and that is by utilizing a phototunable chiral dopant in which the helical twisting power can be tuned with light illumination, and we can, in this case, go from 7 to about 17 microns in pitch. And so with the help of our numerical simulations and some handedness isosurfaces here, we can see in the side view, as we expose our solitons to light, they want to run away, which we can understand simply remembering that these solitons represent local free energy minima. And therefore, when we're changing the pitch, we're changing that free energy minima. 
And so they want to run away from the light and stay in the dark where they represent that minima. We can use this to self-assemble arrays of solitons and anneal defects, as well as pushing them around. And in this case, it even looks like we're playing a little video game with our solitons, which fittingly, I had uh, an undergraduate student doing this experiment. <laughs> So in conclusion, I think I'm out of time, so I'll let you all read this. And thank you for your attention. Yes. Oh, all the way in the back.